Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by John Jobson. John, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, Paul. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, we spoke to your brother fairly recently, Michael, yeah. and uh, he suggested that I get in touch to get you along to the show. And what happened last week is I was standing through there talking to Jim Leishman when you phoned me back, mm-hmm. and Big Leash picked up the phone. Yeah, big Jimmy. <laughs> big Jimmy. So that took you back to your coaching career, but we'll go further back than that to your playing days, your upbringing in Fife, you know, your brother who went on to be a world superstar in the music industry. And uh, obviously, it's a great story. I mean, we're talking about Arthur McKenna. Yeah. Just before we came on, I used to get on the Arthur McKenna log early bus, but you knew Arthur. Yeah, I knew him very well. Him and my, him and my father were great friends. You know, my, my father was originally a, a Hibs fan. But Arthur, him and Arthur worked at the at the at Soldier's Mine together, right? And they became friends. And then my, my dad sort of switched allegiance and started following Celtic, you know. So, but yeah. Arthur McKenna was responsible for well for loads of people's love of Celtic because he gave us access, mm-hmm. you know, organised buses, you know, and we, we travelled we travelled the country. That's brilliant, eh? Yeah, great man. Out of the small villages of Fife, you know, giving you access to the yeah the team. I mean. Your first cup final, nineteen sixty five. Yeah, that was the start of it, Paul. You know, the start of the revolution, really. Probably the one of the greatest club sides mm-hmm. in history. You know, Billy McNeil scores the scores the winner. One hundred and ten thousand people in the ground. You know, fantastic. As you say, that was the beginning. I mean, yep. and of course, we defeated Dunfermline that day, three two. Yeah. Your hometown club, really, Dunfermline, and that that club pops in and out of this story as we go through mm-hmm. your life. But take us back. A lot of people aren't aware of the you know the West Five Villages and the Five Villages and the, the mining towns, the pit towns. Yeah. What was it like being brought up? You're one of five boys. Yep. Your dad's a miner. Yeah, well, we were sort of self sufficient in those days. You, you looked after yourself, you know. Uh, always outdoors. Uh, football was the was the thing. Mm-hmm. And as, everybody was good at football. You know, big skinny guys and wee fat guys and, you know, cyclopses and all that. They, 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 they could all play. <laughs> you, you get them in Fife right enough. <laughs> <laughs> they could all play and that was, uh, that's what we did. Great childhood. Aye. You know, but where I was brought up in Blingery, it was a, it was a mixed community. You know, there was there was Irish people that had come to settle and there was the, the, the Presbyterian side of the, but everybody got in great, Everybody. Nay, nay sectarianism, nay bigotry. Just a, it's a great place to be brought up. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I love this. Um, I've got a brother myself, but for five brothers to be brought up in one household and to have such a talent in various different fields. Yeah. So yeah. I get my hair cut in Dunfermline, best barber shop in Dunfermline. It's your brother. We're Brian, yeah. Yeah, you've got Richard who obviously made yeah. his name in the skids in a big way. Michael, who we spoke to recently, who's still involved in the music industry. Yeah. Um, and Francis, yeah, it was an older. He was the oldest guy. Yeah, he unfortunately died in India, you know, third world country. So mm-hmm. we got his bones home, you know. But he was a, he was a great guy, artist, uh, loved his music. I, I remember what Richard said about him that uh, if he'd been brought up in a city, you know, we might have seen, we might have seen the the guy. I mean, mm-hmm. highly regarded in Blingery, you know. Everybody loved him, you know. He was a he was a one-off, Francis. Was he introducing the Blingery natives to certain types of music? Back I then? was introducing them to Captain Beefheart. And, mm-hmm. Brilliant. You know, Grateful Dead and Dr John and all these people, you know. Before his time? Well, long before his time, yeah. And, you know, I'm proud of the villages. I, I never criticise them. Um, but you can see how that would be difficult if you work artistic within the villages. Yeah, it's yeah. A, you know, it was a proper old-fashioned kind of yeah. view. It was a pit, it was a mining village. Yeah. Uh, and back then it may have been quite difficult to, to flourish. Well, Francis and my dad were, were at loggerheads a lot. You know, my dad didn't like the, you know, he was he was different, you know. But he was still a, a wonderful guy. You know, and I come along and play football and it sort of, you know, that, that worked against Francis, I thought. You know, with him being, him being a head case, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> and... Talented artist and that kind oh, of thing. Oh, brilliant guy, aye. Was anyone else showing promise as a footballer, John, or did you get the football genes? Uh, in the family? Mm-hmm. Well, it was just me because there was there was nothing else, you know. As I say, I got introduced to the to the, the, the great 
the great Celtic, the, the team of 65 going on, and it had a huge influence on me, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I want to do, you know. I want to, well, I, I wanted to watch them, you know. Jimmy Johnson, God almighty. So that was a, that was a big influence on me just kicking a ball. Plus there was, what else do you do? Mm-hmm. And you're the a guys fan of Bobby Murdoch as well, John. Oh, Bobby Murdoch was easy. He was my favourite player. I wanted to be, to be Bob. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I was saying on the way through, having spoken to a lot of his teammates, a lot of people say, yeah, he was the guy that orchestrated yeah. things. We think he was the entertainer. Mm-hmm. Then you had Big Billy at the back. He was the leader. What a side! I mean, you, you've seen him in '65. You also seen the 1969 Cup final. Yeah. And I'll call it the George Conley Cup final yeah. because of my association with High Valley Field. But there's a young Fife lad making it and making a name for himself. Did yeah. you look at guys like that, maybe Jim Baxter, and think, I can make it here? Well, George was a... That, that, that was a... It was a big thing for guys that worked in, that, that was involved because everybody knew where he came from. You know, George was 15-year-old. He was he was going around the, the track at Parkhead keeping a ball up, you know. So, and we all knew that he came from Valafield. Because Valafield and Blingery have got, they've got connections. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the, the McGirt family stayed in Valafield and we, we, we had McGirt's and Blingery, you know, so there was a, there was a connection with Valafield. But George was just a, he was a Rolls Royce, a football player. Because I mentioned in, to you before, Paul, that uh, Big Jockstein dropped Jimmy Johnson for that game. I don't know if it was, you know, but, so George is playing on the right wing and he and he scores a goal that for a young lad, you know, takes the ball off Big Greg's feet and walks his room the goalkeeper and sticks it in the net, man. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> I talk to a, a lot of my family members who are from Valleyfield and they, you know, when he scored that goal, it was almost as if they were scoring it for, for the village. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. And he turns room and I don't think he had his front teeth in that day. Yeah. You know? But it was great. And you had the pleasure of playing against him yeah. later on in his career. We'll come to that as well. And um, Because obviously you started playing yourself. You showed some promise. And you were playing your football in Kirkcaldy at that time. Yeah, Kirkcaldy YM. So I was playing for the school in the morning. Uh, I was at St Andrews High School in Kirkcaldy. So Kirkcaldy was a, was a big part of my, my youth. And I started playing for Kirkcaldy YM. Uh, you know, good standard of football, good players, uh, enjoyed it. And then something happened. I don't know I don't know what happened, but uh, there was a couple of guys in Blingery started uh, an underage team, uh, Blingery Rovers. It was a guy called Ryan Marr, who sadly passed a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and Kerry Murphy, and they started uh, an under-18 team. And it was fully, really good players. Again, guys that played at senior level and, and then uh, I, I'd scored a few goals, you know. I, I, I became a striker by accident. You know, Brian Marley says to me one day, would you, because I, I wanted to be Bobby Murdoch, you know. So he says to me, would you fancy having a go as a striker? I says, yeah, no problem. So and it, it kind of worked and I, I scored a few goals. And and then I signed for, I signed for Wraith. Uh, they got relegated and then I, I, got, I got put to Logelli Albert, a, a local junior team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was just there for a couple of months and back to back to Starts Park. Now, <clears throat> when you were playing at Wraith Rovers, who was your manager at that time, John? Well, George Farm was my original manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he got sacked. Uh, Bertie Payton took over for a couple of months. Uh, Bertie was a bit of a rebel, you know. Uh, <laughs> and he, he wouldn't take any nonsense for board people and stuff like that, guys on the board. And Bertie lost his job. And then we got Andy Matthew who had the uh, ex-Rangers player. Uh, I think he found out that was a Catholic and <laughs> banished to the stand this <laughs> week. <you know? laughs> but that's, I mean, that's the thing we can laugh about it now, John, but that was a big, big problem yeah, back I'd, back then. You know, I would think so, yeah. I think there's certain areas of society where it still is a problem, mm-hmm, but yeah. back then, you know, certain places you couldn't get a job if mm-hmm. you were a Catholic. Yeah. The favouritism within the football Mm-hmm. Obviously existed uh, yeah. back then as well. Yeah, um, you you said you 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 were on the bench a lot for Wraith Rovers. You're a young yeah. boy at that stage. Uh, when did it come apparent to you that you should you should leave for more opportunities? Well, I'd, I'd got injured. I wanted to stay at Wraith Rovers because uh, I loved the place. You know, it was a it was a special place for me. Loved Wraith Rovers, 
Uh, and then I got a I got a knee injury uh, that you know I had to get operated on, and uh, I was out for a good few months, and then I got released, mm-hmm. which was it was really unexpected. I thought I might have uh, had it. They gave me some more time, and I mean I recovered well from it, you know. And then I, I kind of lost my way for a wee while because I, I kind of felt sorry for myself, and and but you know things picked up. I got a move to Berwick. Which I loved, loved uh, doing it Berwick. Great place to play. Won the championship with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, then left there and then uh, went to Meadowbank. Meadowbank seemed to be my last. Uh, this is my last hurrah. If I can't uh, score a few goals here, I'm I'm going to play fucking darts or something like that, you know. <laughs> so it, it, it kind of worked out. What I love about speaking about these these teams uh, during the 1970s is the kind of characters that come through Yeah, and uh, when you had a, a short spell at Count Beath, your manager was Frank, Frank Connor, Connor, yeah, who'll be known to Celtic fans yeah. because, you know, he was an ex-player, he was a goalkeeper yeah. at Celtic and he has quite a few spells as a reserve yeah. coach he even managed the first team for a couple yeah, of games did I. Yeah. what kind of a man was Frank Connor back then? Frank used to he used to pick a guy each night and he, he would train with them. Frank used to wear a, a white doctor's coat, and he would train with. And his training was it was really hard under Frank. You know, he was a hard, hard taskmaster, but brilliant guy. He used to sing on the bus. You know, I, I think Frank had seven kids, right? And that's what he used to say. He used to grab the mic on the bus, and he goes, uh, "He says, there's a thing about us Catholics. He says, uh, we can't add, but we can multiply." <laughs> 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 but he left Cowdenbeath to go to Celtic, you know, aye, and, aye. and I was only I was only in a month to month thing with Cowdenbeath, and uh, I had a connection with, with Berwick because uh, there was a guy called Wally Matheson uh, played with me at Wraith. He was a Rangers player, played in the played in the seventy two Cup on our cup side, mm-hmm. and Davy Smith was the manager who Davy also played. So I went down there and uh, I liked it, but uh, Davy would never play me as a striker, you know. I always got these marking jobs today, and but I enjoyed my time there, and I, and I met Davy Moyes, which was the which was a wonderful thing to meet Dave. Now I'll just make this clear to anyone listening in: D- this is the original Davy Moyes, yeah, the, the no, real, no, no, the Celtic one. No, no. This is the real Davy Moyes, yeah. and Davy's from Trinent. Yep, uh, he later played at Dunfermline, but you spent some time at Berwick. What's your memories of, of Davy back then? No nonsense. Well, Davy was. Uh, David was actually a quiet guy, but you know, and when we won the championship at Berwick, uh, uh, David Smith signed a couple of guys for the North of England, and, and David couldn't take to them. You know, he just didn't like them. But uh, I got some great stories with David. Is, is it okay to <laughs> share them? Absolutely. We we'd won the championship at Berwick, and we went on a on a tour up north. We were playing Bucky Thistle on the Saturday and then it was a four-team tournament on the Sunday at Devon and Vale, which is in Banff. Devon and Vale is the name of the of the team that, that plays in Banff. Beautiful ground and, you know. So we played uh, St Myrne in the one semi-final and Peterhead played Hearts. So Peterhead beat Hearts. Uh, Berwick, we beat St Myrne. So we're playing Peterhead in the final and they beat us. But anyway... Well, these dressing rooms, at, at this, they were tiny, you know. So Davey, no liking the, the English guys, uh, me and him used to stay back. I had to stay with him, you know. I was the only, I was the only guy he would fucking talk to, you know. So it's your time to go to the shower, and the sh- there was only one shower. It was tiny, you know, so we're in there. And the referee and the two linesmen were in the same shower. So we walked into the shower room. <laughs> And one of the linesmen was a, was a giant of a man. He was six feet six, big red-headed guy. So Davy's fucking looking him up and down. And the guy had the tiniest tadger you've ever seen in your fucking <laughs> life, you know. And Davy's looking through his eyebrows, fucking staring at him. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, no. So Davy goes for the tadger up to the, the big linesman's size and he goes, what a wee cock you've got, linesman. <laughs> I ran out the dressing room. I'm laughing. The other guys are saying, "What's happened there?" And I tell them, and Davy comes into the dressing room. I says, "What did he fucking say that to the guy for?" Davy draws anything. You want me to tell the man lies? You know. 
That was the type of boy he was, brilliant. <laughs> that linesman probably never officiated another well, game after that. What a wee dodger, you've got linesman. <laughs> <laughs> Just telling him the truth. David, uh, David stayed in Trinent, so back in the back in the day, he was, he was getting picked, we used to get picked up at Waterloo Place in Edinburgh. That was the that was the start of the journey down to Berwick. So David, such and such a time in Trinent, you know, we all got our times at the training, and the bus would pick you up in the main drag in Trinent. That bus was five minutes late. David used to go home. Getting this big bus driving off through the streets of Trinent, trying to find him, and the yeah, me, he was some boy. I had the pleasure of meeting him once yeah. about his time at Dunfermline, so <coughs> we'll talk about that as well. But when you, you look at your career in football, the team that seemed to give you the best success was Meadowbank. Bank. Yeah, you were yeah. prolific at yeah. Meadowbank Bank Thistle. There's a brilliant picture, John, in your brother's barber shop in Dunfermline. Yeah. Are you at Tyne Castle playing for Meadowbank Bank and you're shaking George Best's hand, yeah. George Best then of Hibs. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Well, we, we, we drew Hibs, uh, it, was, it was a home tie. Uh, but obviously they couldn't hear the game at Meadowbank Stadium, you know, because they, they, they couldn't police it and things like that. So it got moved to Tynecastle. So then uh, we played, we played uh, Hibs at Tyne. They beat us 1-0. And although uh, he didn't do much in the game, he did, he did one or two things that you just, you know, God almighty, what a player. Ah, what a genius, eh? Yeah, yeah. If he had, even if he had been Scottish, he would have played in three or four World Cups, you mm-hmm. know, and mm-hmm. the world would have been able to, to see him at his best, you know. Now, he had a smile on his face when you were shaking his hand. Were you asking him to go for a pint after the game? Aye, ah, I says, do you, do you fancy a pint? Then he says, eh, fuck off, you fiend, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cracking picture. The, the other interesting thing that I found interesting anyway is you appear in the sleeve notes of a Skids album that were written by John Peel. Yeah. The famous radio DJ who admired you greatly as a footballer. Yeah. What what was the story when he came to Hamden to see you play? It was a there was a radio show on a Saturday called uh, Walters Weekly. There's a guy called John Walters who had this and John Peel was obviously doing a doing a live link with him and so we'd played uh, Queen's Park at Hamden. Uh, I remember the game uh, uh, one each I scored. Uh goes into the into the dressing room after the game and the manager at the time was a guy called Wally McFarlane and me and Wally had a kind of love hate thing, you know, and and he come in and he goes, uh, I'm putting the clays on, and he goes, John Peel's out there wanting to see you, and I says, Oh, hey, you go, oh, fucking Rod, you know, John fucking Peel, you know, and uh, it turned out that it was, you know, and he's got the he's got the thing on the on his back with the microphone, and I'm thinking he's going to talk about Richard, you know, and because John Peel had a big part to play in the mm-hmm. in the original success of the Skids. A big fan, you know, and uh, it was uh, it was about football, you know, which was maybe that was my fifteen minutes of fame, Paul, you know, that Andy Warhol thing that, uh, <laughs> that uh, but it's great. I think though people do like a cult footballer, John. They do like someone who you know you're making your name at Meadow Bank, who are an unfashionable yeah. Scottish side. John Peel's attached them to you yeah. being Richard's brother. Um, but it takes us on to, to Richard and the success of the Skids yeah. as well. And it's important, I think, I'm Dunfermline born and bred. I still reside in Dunfermline. They're a band that gives a lot of pride to Dunfermline yeah. and, you know, the outlying villages and all the rest of it because yeah. they've done so well and they continue yeah. to. Well, the, the, the fact about it is that none of them came from Dunfermline. You know, there was no Dunfermline residents. Mm-hmm. I mean, Richard was a, a blingy boy. Uh, Billy Simpson was from Loch Gielly. Uh, Tom Kellican was cowed me and Stuart was uh, was Crossgates. So, but fantastic man. Probably, eh? I I think I mentioned it to you that Richard and Stuart Adamson, are, are, in my opinion, uh, are the best songwriting duo this country's ever produced. Forty years on, mm-hmm. you know, timeless songs, timeless guitar riffs, and yeah, fantastic, great. You got a great sense of pride. I think pride is one of the. One of the best emotions that you can yeah. that you can have, and Richard, uh, as does Michael and Brian, certainly certainly give that to me. You know, to mm-hmm. have great pride in these people. You know, oh, definitely. Yeah. What was the the best moment for you, seeing your your brothers rise with the skids? What was the the, the finest moment for you? Because I mean, they supported the Clash, the Stranglers. Yeah, I could. There wasn't any one particular moment, but I think. Uh, I think their album, the Absolute Game, was the 
it's 40 years, it's 40 years anniversary. And for anybody that's never heard this album, listen to it. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that would be my big skids moment. And then going to see them now, going to see them, well, obviously with the with the pandemic, we can't do that. But I've been at a few, went, and went to see them at the Albert Hall uh, last year. You know, imagine that. I know, yeah. the, the, the first gig was in the Belleville in Dunfermline. You know, you remember the old Belleville? I think the, that was before my time, John. But we'll see the building across for the, the entrance to the bus station. Yes. Well, that, that used to be called the Belleville Hotel. Right, right. And they had live gigs. That was the kids' first live gig was in there. Mm-hmm. And then they're, you know, 40 years down the line, they're, they're lifting the, the lid off the Albert Hall. Oh, that's brilliant. Absolutely. I mean, I was sitting there and just, you know, what's this fucking happening here? You know? I knew Richard was just, they were fantastic that night. I see Richard now, what age is he, 60? He's 60 in October, yeah. He's in great shape, eh? He certainly is. He's, he's, he loves clean, Richard. Mm. You know, he's, he doesn't drink a lot. Practically nothing. He uh, likes his uh, gym and his and his fitness and stuff like that, you know. And he's he, taken a, a liking to St. Pauli. We were talking about that earlier as yeah. well. Yeah, he's, he's... I don't know how it originated, Paul, but obviously they play, they play one of his songs and... And, uh, you know, th- th- there's a St. Paul connection with the with the new consortium that's taken over at Dunfermline, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, Richard likes, uh, he likes going to watch German football. You know, his, his son, uh, his son Archie was, was based in Berlin for a wee while. And uh, going to watch football in Germany is totally different from going here. It's dirt cheap for mm-hmm. a start. Yep. It's, it's the most watched league in the world. You know, they pick you up at the station and they take you to the game, they give you a beer. Mm-hmm. Every club. It's as if they actually want you to be there, John. They want you to be you know there, I mean? yeah. Yep. yeah. So Whereas in this country, they make everything so difficult. Oh, God, no. Be that getting to the games yeah. once you're in there. Yeah. I went, I was at Celtic Park fairly recently, took the wee boy through. There's not even anywhere you can take your beer to the toilet. Yeah. You know, if you're, you visit the superstore or whatever mm-hmm. on a, a non match day. But the German football, they've got it nailed. Yeah. They know how to treat the fans. Definitely. And it shows with the attendances. Yeah. But I loved, I did love seeing um, Richard wearing the St. Pauli t-shirts yeah. and and obviously um, I've got my, my face mask for the corona and it's a skids one with the skull yeah. and crossbone on it. Uh, peaceful so times. It's that's cool, it. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely superb. So very, very proud moments for you but you, you mentioned Stuart as well and greatly, greatly missed. Oh, definitely. Definitely. He was a, he was a smart, really fun-loving guy. No, no devilment, but just sitting, having a... Stuart loved to, to talk about his village, mm-hmm. you know, which that's where all our humour comes from, you know. It's village humour. It's putting somebody... You know what the story is, but it's putting somebody for that village <laughs> into the story, you know. Yep. And then, you know, it's lo- localised humour, I call it. There's great know? comedy from the villages, eh? Oh, it's just... And, and again, from the pits as well, John. Yeah, non-stop. Because they needed a bit of sense yeah. of humour, didn't they? Yeah, uh, the places where we get all the all the characters are all gone now. There's no, there's no these gentle, really funny characters. You know, that my, my father was always attracted to the older guys because they had stories to tell. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so and uh, he was a he was a wonderful storyteller. My dad, you know, he was a poet. You know, so yeah, I get I get a lot of my stuff. Obviously, if uh, the big Jeb, you know. Now, you were telling us a story on the way through as well, John, about when he came to watch you. Aye. And he, he, he spoke to your manager. Please share that with us. Yeah, well, it was... Uh, I was at Berwick at the time, and uh, it was a really bad winter, Paul, you know. So, Davy Smith phoned us up and says, uh, we've got a game arranged against Eyemouth, you know, which has been coastal. There was no snow or anything like that. He says, can you get yourself down and... I says, ah, no problem. So it was just after Christmas. So my dad gets his cousin, uh, there's a guy called Adrian Duffy, to drive us down. And it, as I say, it, it was just after Christmas, and my mum had bought him uh, this fucking sheepskin coat number, you know. The mo- we called, me and my brothers called it the Motson, you know. It was a John Motson coat. So anyway, we get to do it to Berwick, and uh, there's a fair wee crowd. It's in a public park, but everyone was, everyone was okay, it was fine. Sort of mixture of first team guys and, and guys that weren't getting a game in. So the chairman of Berwick at the time was a guy called Alec McNabb. He was a he was a justice of the peace, you know. 
kind of feared figure and so my dad's got the Motson on and he goes right up to McNabb during the game and gets this fucking notebook out his pocket and goes uh, who's this boy Jobson that's playing here and uh, Alec McNabb says there he's there number whatever number I had on so my dad starting to write things down so it must have been playing on Alec McNabb's mind you know who the fuck is this guy you know so Alec McNabb goes up to my dad and says uh, by the way you're you're inquiring about one of my players John Jobson he goes uh, who are you my old man says, I'm the Arsenal representative. You could have never missed a game for two years. That's <laughs> fucking hopeless. <laughs> there was a few rumours when you were at Meadow Bank that clubs were interested as well. Aye, ah, it was clubs for sort of second division England, you know, but nothing ever came to fruition. Mm-hmm. I'd scored a lot of goals and I thought somebody somebody might do something, but I don't know. I don't know what, what kind of happened there. When did you decide or when did they move? Away from Meadow Bank, this all materialised, John? Uh, it was just, uh, when was it now? It was 82. Uh, I guess a phone call off Alec Totten, who had just took, taken over at, uh, at Falkirk, and Falkirk were in the league above Meadow Bank. And he says, I've arranged for you to, uh, to come and play for Falkirk. This is great, don't do me. So we went there and had a, I mean, Falkirk were in relegation trouble uh, that year, but uh, Alec had signed a lot of players. He'd signed five or six players. Myself, uh, Peter Houston, mm-hmm. Peter signed for Albion Rovers. I mean, Peter's a, Peter's a Celtic fan, you know. And uh, me and him played up front together. We, we formed uh, no bad uh, relationship. And, and then the next year I got, uh, I got hurt. And uh, I went on loan to Alloa. Uh, Big Willie Gardner uh, was the manager. Yep. Scored twice in his Celtic debut <laughs> for fucking Aberdeen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, there's a week that I, I'll, I'll not forget, but played against Morton on uh, on a Wednesday night, scored a goal, uh, beat Morton. Saturday, we, we played Air United. And uh, I go, it was a, I got injured in a in a collision with a goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Hugh Sprott was his name. He was a he was kind of well known. The guy he was he was a big kids fan as well, you know, because he he come he, he sent me a note when I was in hospital, and that was me finished. What age were you, John? Twenty six. I was only starting to get good at football, and I had to I had to get up. Terrible. But couldn't run or anything after it, you know. It was a it was shin bone and it was low down, mm-hmm. so it, it took a long, long time to heal. And in those days, well, in those times, uh, you know. It's butchery, you know. If it had been the modern day, I'd have be, been fine. Now, at any point did you think to yourself, I want to still be involved in the game, I want to move into coaching? Well, I, I never ever thought I was out of the game, you mm-hmm. know, because mm-hmm. I'm young and I'm... Because I'd been injured before, you know. Everybody in my day got injured because it was a... It was a really physical... A physical thing, fit boy, you know. I mean, I'm... A, a, I'm always playing against giants. I mean, I'm no very tall. I'm maybe five ten, but I'm playing against the the redheaded linesman every week, you know. <laughs> and the, the, there was always a thing. I didn't kind of have to still do it, but the, the clatter you in the first couple of minutes, and that's supposed to that's supposed to do something to you, aye, you know. Aye. Didn't they do anything to me? I, I just said, "Well, you're going to have to keep that up for ninety minutes, you know, because I'm not going anywhere, you know." But it was physical and. But I, I never ever thought that uh, that I was I wasn't going to play again. But having the, uh, having the recuperation was, I mean, running was a big part of what I did, and I I couldn't do it. It mm-hmm. was a, it was a running limp that I had, and my ankle would swell up, and no, nah, couldn't uh, couldn't continue. And at that age as well, I mean, I was going to say any regrets in in your football career because when I was talking to Michael he spoke about how you had the talent but you know you, you might have gone further do you think the biggest regret is the injury there's nothing else you could have done any differently uh, yeah I, I suppose uh, I suppose that as I, as I say I was starting to get to to grips with the position that I played you know because as a striker you're, you're you're different for everybody else and you, everybody's looking forward you're 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 no uh, you're facing the game, you know. 
goals are behind you. So you're you're playing with your back to goal all the time. And uh, as I say, I, would, I was starting to to learn how to play this and, and play it well, you know, to know what to do. It was funny last week when uh, Jim Leishman was in the, the studio, John, and I had been phoning you. You phoned me back whilst Jim was in. He answered the phone and uh, probably the only way that Jim Leishman knows how. Um, I, I don't think I'll repeat his words. Um, but obviously you, you got into Dunfermline, where were you at the time when Big Leash got the job? Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bobby Maxwell, uh, uh, got in touch with me and says that, that he was running an under-21 under team in Kelty. So he asked me if I would come along and I thought, yeah, good, I'm, I'm not doing anything. So I was there a couple of weeks and I, I was liking it, you know, I was enjoying it. And then Big Jim uh, phoned me up and asked me if I'd like to come along and coach, uh, coach his youth team. Dunfer- Jim had just taken over at Dunfermline at the time. Don Forsyth, you know, R.I.P. died a, a week ago. He was he had been sacked, and Jim was on his staff. And Jim got the job. I think he only got a temporary, you know. Mm. But then he, he asked me to come along, and you know, I was there for four years after, uh, after that. Now, see when you're. I've seen a great picture of you wearing the old Umbro tracks yeah. and all the rest of it, John. There's no many pictures of you, actually, just the team groups. Yeah. You were tasked with looking after a, a group of young guys. Mm-hmm. And if anybody knows how we throwed with, you know, East End Park there, yeah. there's now a garage, but that was your training pitch, yeah, and you like a, a red ash, was it? red ash mm-hmm. pitch, yeah. Who, who's the, the, the boys that you were looking after at that stage? Uh, well, I think the most uh, notable one is, is David Bingham. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was 12 years old at the time. David Sinclair, uh, Sean Strang, Raymond Sharp, they were all, they were, they were all there, every mm-hmm. one of them. And three or four years down the line, they, they, they won the BP Youth Cup, right. you know. Scott Ferguson, again, lovely football players. But we Bingham was the was a standout player, I would say. He went on to have a, a long and good career, David, you know. He did. Ah, he was a smashing lad. Yeah. And uh, obviously Sinky from High Valleyfield as well. Dave, still to see Dave yet. Dave stays no far from me. I think, did David know follow Jimmy Nickel down to Millwall? He did, aye. Aye, after the cup win. Yeah. Uh, that we're not going to talk about. No, no, I was there. Ah, uh, worst day of my Celtic support in life, that. Yeah. Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. And of course, you've got that local interest to Wraith Rovers, but you didn't, you didn't want no. them to win the cup. But um, when I'm looking at that Dunfermline side, and we spoke a fair bit last week to Jim Leishman about it, I think of Big Norrie. I think of Winker yeah. Watson. I mean, what's your memories of the likes of Norrie McCarthy? Another... Dunfermline legend. Yeah, Norrie was a... a key, he was a top footballer, <laughs> uh, but he was also a top guy. You know, Norrie was pretty quiet. You know, him and Big, Big Watson, they were, they were up to capers, you know. They would they, they liked the practical joke and stuff like that. I was never into that. I didn't like, you know, somebody fucking putting deep heat in your, in your underpants and all that, but... But they were they were two big big players for Dunfermline. That's that's how I remember them. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, at the time of Norrie's death, uh, Norrie wasn't far off getting capped. You know, because we had a problem in Scotland, had a problem in that area, and he was as good as any that was going to be at that time. He was a monster. Mm-hmm. You know, when he first came to Dunfermline, excuse me, he was a bit raw. He was a midfield player, and uh, they, they changed him to a centre back, and he. He was quick and, you know, you're, you're no messing with this guy, you know. And that's where he made his name at centre-back. And yeah. I remember he did get a cap. I think it was a B, it was a B, B cap. B thing, I him mm-hmm. and John, I. But we had the, you know, it's an, it's old school. That right through the centre of that team was, was good. Good goalkeeper, Ian, uh, Ian Westwater. Big Norrie, centre-back. Stevie Morrison, Moisey, uh, wee Gary Thompson, centre-midfield players. And John Watson up front. Mm-hmm. And two really good wide players as well. Jim Bowie uh, and Ian McCall. You know, the the famous uh, famous managers who's a nutcase as well. You know. Leash picked him up from Queen's Park, didn't he? Aye. So what kind of manager was Jim Leishman? Because I've spoke to a lot of the players. Yeah. And, the, you know, Jim's the first to say he wasn't a tactician. No. But he had a, a motivational sense that he could motivate a man 
to play football for him. Was yeah, that what you saw in him? No, I saw... Jim was not the, the most popular guy in Scottish football with these fucking echelons that run the, the SFA thing. Uh, and he wasn't too popular with his methods, but what he did do was uh, he signed good players. Mm-hmm. That's, what he, that's what he was really good at. He knew what was good. You didn't get three promotions in three years with, without, being, without having a knowledge of, of football and people. You read people well, Jim. It was a great place to be, Paul. Mm-hmm. It was everybody was happy, and there was no nonsense, no no cliqueiness. You know, it was all geared around the uh, winning games on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, if my maths right, I don't think them found and lost six league games in a year. I think that's all they lost. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, you know, crowds for. 1,200 up to 9,000. and Brilliant. Uh, Jim Leesman turned uh, Dunfermline into a big club. I think that's the biggest tribute I can get him. I mean, mm-hmm. I love the big guy. He breathed he's, a bit of life into the town as well, John. Well, he did. Uh, he's you now in the provost, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like fucking Mr. T going about there with <laughs> young big, young big Jen. But a smashing big well. boy. That, he wears it well. That, that uh, turned Dunfermline into a big club. That's what he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another thing, when I was talking to your brother, he, he, he mentioned the fact that obviously you had been at Oakley United. I wasn't aware of that. And George Conley, yeah. the great George Conley, played for Oakley United for a game, I think. Did you see? Yeah, I was only there once when he uh, when he played. But you did play against him when he was near him in the once end. He, when he left Celtic, well, he, he had a couple of outings uh, with Falkirk. So I'm at the Rovers and we're playing, we're playing Falkirk and George is... George is in their team, you know. He must have been 18, 19 stone and fucking stripped in the fat him, you know, but his belly hanging out. So I never started that game as I didn't start many games, Paul. Uh, but I got on as a substitute and uh, you're rubbing your hands, you know. Fucking playing against this guy, can't he? There's nobody can get near him. He's plucking balls out the air and, you know. Th- Minded me of uh, Davy Smith a lot. They, they used to do that with Dave Smith at Berwick. They thought Davy was finished, you know. What a football player, man. Mm-hmm. Him and George used to come off the pitch spotless. You know, we're no playing on bowling greens like like what they are now. These guys just... George Connolly should have had, uh, had 100 caps for Scotland. No do it in my mind. But things took a... Things took a turn for him and he... You know... But he's, he's big and strong and healthy these days. Yeah, it's good to see. Yeah. I always find it interesting. You've you've been at the game where he scores as a young skinny laddie wearing yeah. the number seven shorts in the cup final and it goes full circle and you end up playing against yeah. him. But you can still see the class. Well, I mean, George Connolly only has to... Somebody says to him, how did you... What was, what was your football career like? And he'll go, well, I played as a centre-back. Uh, I scored in two Scottish Cup finals. And a European Cup semi-final. Mm-hmm. You know, that's enough. Nah, it's incredible. <laughs> for a young boy for the Valley. Huh? And, and now that I mentioned the Valley, you did say something earlier that I, I laughed at because I've heard so many people from High Valley Field who will swear that Into the Valley was about High Valley Field. Could you clear that one up for us as well? No, Valley boys, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Richard wrote the song. Uh, it was mainly based on his friends that during that time there was... There wasn't much employment going on if you if you didn't have qualifications and stuff like that. So a lot of these guys the the they saw a way out as joining the British Army. Mm-hmm. That was uh, you know, it was a it was a, a vocation, you know. And after thirteen weeks they they find themselves on the on the streets of Belfast. That's that's the sort of basis of the song, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what a song. Yeah. Forty two years. Go in the top five, you know. Mm, it's incredible. Yeah. And again, unless I've changed it recently, they, they still play East End. That was the the entrance song, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if it still happens, Paul. Mm-hmm. But you know, it was it's a, the brilliant song. Ah, brilliant. You know, their, their songs have stood the stood the test of time. Oh, they definitely, they definitely yeah. have. 
Now, another thing, because this is a Celtic podcast, I love speaking to people with that wealth of knowledge going right back mm -hmm. to your first cup final, 65, John. If you were to give me the 11 players, put them together as a team, the greatest Celts yeah. in your mind, who would that 11 be? Yeah, well, uh, what I'll say about it is there, there's no many of the, of the modern guys in it, you know, because, well, there's no... Uh, they're no comparable to some of the guys that that, that did make it. Uh, goalkeeper, I'll go for uh, Johnny Thompson because Celtic Football Club existed before 1965, you know. And he was local. He came from Carden Den. And through word of mouth, uh, talking to Celtic people, he was he was a fantastic goalkeeper. So he gets the, he, he gets the goalkeeper. You could have went with... I would think Boric would have been... Would have been one of them, mm -hmm. you know. He could have played there, but Johnny Thompson, right back, it's, it's Danny McGrain, uh, probably the best right back in the world when mm -hmm. he was when he was at his prime. Uh, centre backs, I'm I'm going with McNeil because you know I think everybody, every Celtic fan would have uh, Billy McNeil as a centre back, and I'm going for Van Dyke as his as his partner because well he's a, he's a seventy million pound football player. That's He's got the lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, left back Tommy Gemmel. Uh, Gemmel was quick. He was he was a modern full back in in sixty seven. Scored two goals in in two European Cup finals, you know. That's that's enough. <coughs> I I would go for four in the middle of the pitch because that's kind of the system that I was I was brought up on, you mm -hmm. know. Two wide guys and two of the best players Celtic ever had was Jinky on the right, and I'm going for Bobby Lennox on the left because the guy scored 30 goals a year for, for the wing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a bit of controversy in midfield. But, but I think Paul McStay would get a lot of people's uh, people's vote, but I'm going for Bobby Murdoch and I'm going for David Hay, who was just, you know, he's a fucking killer, man. <laughs> the quiet assassin. Oh, yeah, great player. <laughs> And I, I think the two front players would would pick themselves. You know, it's it's Douglas and Larson. Some side. Aye, they would take a bit of beating. We took we do take a, a great deal of pride in John Thompson being fifers. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as I've said to a few people on the podcast, we used to visit that grave on a regular well, basis. Well, Paul, you know? funny you say that. I mean, I stayed in Blingery, and there's a there's a back road to to Carden Den. You don't have to go up to Loch Gelly and do it to Carden Den. There was a it was passed into the open cast. It was a, a big gas gas plant, mm -hmm. and you could get to cut. And used to walk there every Sunday, just to go and visit this grave. You know, yeah. yeah. So, legend, the, the man. Without, I don't even know if there's any footage. footage uh, I don't think there is. There might be footage of the of the the incident when mm -hmm. it led to his death. You know, mm -hmm. which is purely accidental and. And there was a guy called Sam English who really suffered, yeah. suffered uh, because of it. But five connection, you know. It's brilliant. always good. It's yeah. always good. And we've got Bruni now. And finally, last but not least, the name Jobson yeah. in football continues. Your grandson. Yeah, young uh, young man. Been at Celtic for he was, uh, for he was seven years old. Mm -hmm. He's now 12. He's now stepping up to... Intermediate stage, you know, uh, very proud of him. You know, he's he's comes from his mum's side of the family and ours that uh, we're, we're, we're Celtic people, you know. Mm -hmm. He runs around a bit with the, with the Adidas gear on. That's brilliant. Yeah. Now, he's 12 years old. Where, where does he play just now? And I know that might change, John, but what's his position? Uh, I think we. His mum and dad see him as a midfield player. I think uh, that's because he's got he's loaded with energy. You know, he's uh, he's got an engine on him, Manny. Plus, he's got a fantastic name as well. You know? Isn't it half? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, he was down at uh, he was down at the academy in Southampton, and I phoned him and uh, I said, "How are you doing, son?" He goes, uh, "Granddaddy says uh, I'm on the way to the game. I can't speak to you now." I'll phone you the night for the hotel. <laughs> Fucking eleven years old. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Eh? But I'd, I'd love to for my dad to have to have seen him uh, in his in this position. You know. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, 
Superb. Well, hopefully in the future we'll see Jobson on the back of the green and white hoops. Yeah, hopefully. That'd yeah, be amazing. It'd be, be great. Ad. As long as he enjoys his football, Paul, that's the Aye. that's the most important thing. Definitely. Yeah. Now, John, we we'll spoke to your brother, we we'll spoke to yourself. I've loved your tales today. It's been fantastic having yeah. you on the podcast. So thank you very much for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>